well, we're apologetic. We did everything we could to try to convey the news over the last month that we were changing nights. But I understand once you start something on a Tuesday, well, there's some real Tuesday-oriented people right there. So, um, so I apologize for that. Um, <coughs> this is incredibly good timing that we have a, a specialist in public health here tonight because his main purpose, whatever he was going to do, talking about fracking, he is now going to protect you from me, I think will be the goal. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just make sure that, and himself, don't forget to protect yourself on this at the same time. Uh, but really, I would not have missed this because this is a talk, I think, of where a lot of our issues come together and I'm really happy to be here. As you may know, we're competing with two, uh, the scheduling on this is really quite remarkable, that Providence has guided Josh Fox to come to the Boulder campus tonight to show his documentary, the second of his Gasland series, is now over at the UMC tonight with Josh Fox himself there. So that's interesting, Gasland too. And then uh, various people on other sides of the issue then rallied to make sure that there was a counter event of a documentary, so-called documentary nature. And uh, so with, we've got Gasland and then we have Frat Nation downtown at the Boulder Theater. And then we have some very wise and balanced and sensible and well, reasonable people who came to hear Dr. Goldstein. So that is the way the world is, yeah, has balanced out. I, I'm sure that seeing Josh Fox will be very entertaining for the people there. It will uh, give them a sense of having seen, I guess, a sort of mockumentary rock star of some kind. So that will be fun for them. But I feel that we'll be here tonight in a way that will um, one of the great things that will happen is that I'll stop talking in this voice. That will be a really important part of it. We'll follow, though, our usual procedure of having you write questions because uh, with a group a little bit smaller, we could just go ahead with spoken questions, but we're keeping a very good record of the questions people ask at these events, so we don't want to stop that. So we will stick with the asking of questions in writing. And in about half an hour, people from the center will come around and pick those, those questions up. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Goldstein, uh, and his website describes himself as with a major, his major professional activities are related to the public health implications of Marcellus Shale activities and to the scientific framework for sustainability. So the match and our issues and topics is very important. One of the things that we hope to have out of this project is a more robust and consequential conversation between the Marcellus region and this region. So your presence is ideal for that and much of your work also builds to the value of this evening. Uh, Dr. Goldstein is a co-author of an article called Missing from the Table, the role of the environmental and public health community and government advisory commissions related to Marcellus Shale drilling. Not missing from this table, though it's important to say, nor from our project. Because I think John Adgate, I saw you come in, did I not John? But there's John Adgate, who's a member of our team from the CU Health Sciences Center. Uh, he has written on the Gulf, Dr. Goldstein has written on the Gulf oil spill. He's written on um, benzene as a cause of certain disorders. Our friend benzene, who we cannot keep from running into at these events, that's an important thing for us to hear more about. And then an interesting title, Risk Assessment of Environmental Chemicals If It Ain't Broke. So how exciting to think there's something that is not broken in this world of environmental regulation. So we'll look forward to hearing um, more about that. He's involved in many, many groups working on Marcellus Shale issues. He's at, at the table over and over and over again. I won't go through the whole list, but it is really a pleasure for me to stop talking. It's been getting worse in the course of the day. If there's any blessing in this, I probably will lose my voice entirely tomorrow, which will be a benefit to Western America. So, um, so my last remark here, my last remark seems really sad, but to say, but it's a very happy remark. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Dr. Goldstein. Mike. Yeah, this is now. I, of course, I take out the mic and I find out it's my cell phone. So you know, it's a great start. Uh, yeah, thanks. The, the uh, I, you know, this this is such an interesting issue. It is an issue that is challenging. It is to me the essence of the kind of of challenges we're facing when we talk about sustainability or we talk about any of these broader issues. Sometimes people talk about wicked issues and. Uh, I like to think of, of where we've been in the environment and 
I, I want you to believe everything I say, but uh, the first thing I'm sure you won't believe because I look so young, but I started in, in environmental stuff and division of air pollution 47 years ago, before EPA was formed. And I've been involved in it ever since. But what I think we've seen through these decades has been a situation in which our first phase has been, let's clean up this obviously dirty air. Uh, Bill Ruckel's house, who was the first head of EPA, liked to talk about uh, the reason EPA was formed is because the people in Denver wanted to see their mountains and the people in Los Angeles wanted to see each other. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the Cuyahoga River went on fire and we had all these obvious issues. And we went through what you might call command and control as to how to regulate these. Um, our next phase was sort of risk assessment. We, we realized that things we couldn't see, the benzene in the air, uh, they, they potentially harmful, and so we needed a better scientific approach, and we needed management based upon this science to deal with it. Um, I think we're going into a third phase, and it's going to occur slowly, just as all these others did, and the third phase is how to deal sustainably with these complex issues. These issues, which there aren't obvious answers, at least I don't think there's an obvious answer here. Um, there's potential benefits, there's potential risks. Uh, and how do we deal with this in an open way, in a transparent way, in a way that gets confidence that uh, we the people are in fact part of the, uh, the answer? So I'm, I'm going to go through, I, did, I left off the title. The title that was given, and I, I, I didn't, it's my fault for not changing it, was a question. Are there, you know, are there public health effects? And the answer is, I don't know. And, and that's what I'm basically going to tell you about. I'll show you the little bit of information we do have. And then I'll show you what to me has been a concerted effort to try to avoid confronting the issue of are there public health effects and what are the public health effects and what are the potential benefits. And so uh, I, I assume this audience you know all about shale gas drilling. I'll show a couple of slides in case some folks haven't. Um, I'm going to look at the, do an overview of the health implications. I'm going to discuss the misperceptions. Uh, and, uh, you know, whether intentional or not, I think a lot of them are intentional. Uh, the lack of transparency and the other tactics that are not, that are basically uh, making it hard to respond to a legitimate question. And then, um, uh, one thing, uh, Patty, I didn't tell you is that I did spend a couple of years um, as the political appointee, as the assistant administrator of EPA in charge of research and development. And when I got there, this is Bill Ruckel's house second coming. Uh, and this was, uh, uh, so I was a, p a political appointee of President Ronald Reagan, which gives me some degree of credibility with some things. I was put in nomination by Bill Bradley. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, uh, my goal, my job was to get the science right at this, again, very difficult time at EPA. And Ruckel's House always told me that I needed to get the words, I needed a simple word to tell him it should not be a four-letter word. Okay? So I'm going to give you a five-letter recommendation at the end of it, single syllable, five letters. You need to know about what my own biases are. Uh, my bias is, is, you know, what's the rush? I happen to think that there is a great potential for benefit, health benefit, having to do not just with greenhouse gas, but having to do uh, with, with replacing coal and its air pollution health effects. And that's a real problem for parts of the country, <coughs> certainly where I live in Pennsylvania, in southwestern Pennsylvania, we exceed the particulate standards. We would not if we were to ab be able to replace uh, uh, the coal that's uh, being used with, with gas. Um, I also happen to think that we're going to probably in the long run drill. We're going to take just about every available natural resource and drill. Uh, now, I hope I'm wrong. I um, hope in fact, that we are get the wind and the solar and the alternative energy sources, so we don't need to do that. But I strongly suspect we will do that. And putting on my public health hat, and I started as a physician and go into public health, but putting on my public health hat, I have to assume that we will, because I have to assume what are the worst possibilities, not are just, you know, what are the most wonderful things that will happen. Um, I've done a lot of work in the Gulf. I still, um, uh, I, I, I chair a, uh, a coordinating committee for part of the uh, the, the, the settlement uh, there, which has to do with health outreach to communities that are very disadvantaged uh, and have already been hit hard by uh, BP and by the uh, uh, Katrina and, and will be hit hard again. And the question is, how do you improve the resilience there? So a lot, some of the things I'll show you come from the Gulf.
But I was very much taken as this Marcella Shell issue developed for us in southwestern Pennsylvania. President Obama's commission was arguing that we ought to start drilling again in the Gulf, in part because if we don't, the, the, the Venezuelans, the Cubans, the Chinese are going to get that uh, oil. So I've been arguing that we really have to start going with the Marcellus Shell because otherwise the Canadians are going to horizontally frack on the Lake Erie <laughs> and steal all our gas. I, I don't want to sound sarcastic, but there is, uh, to me, what's the rush? And I'll come back to that time and time again, but that's basically my bias. Uh, as I said, I've been involved in this a long time. I had thought, as I became a professor emeritus, that you know, my career had been something we had actually moved ahead on how to understand and approach environmental problems. Uh, the shale gas thing makes me think that I just sort of wasted all my time. I, well, have we learned anything? Uh, basically, we're basically just going back to this issue of, well, there may be a problem, that suddenly you get public concern because it looks like people are being made unhealthy, and then we just, it's too late to find out whether in fact there really is a cause and effect relationship. It's really hard to retrospectively evaluate what we've been exposed to, and particularly when you get litigation, and you know, litigation is going to be part of this uh, in terms of the toxic tort issues. So we really have problems doing this unless we confront this up front and start at the beginning, looking, trying to do our best, trying to compare what happens in communities when their things haven't been handled well. And, I will tell you that uh, there are many communities where things ha aren't being handled well. Uh, I will talk about industry. Uh, I want to make it clear at the beginning that there's a wide range of industry activities. Some of the industry folks seem to want to do the right thing. They've got good safety records. There are others that have terrible safety records. Safety culture is not something that's uniform, and uh, we need it to be uniform. We need the kind of laws and regulations that forces it to be uniform. So, what is this all about? Well, simple schematic, there's a, uh, I don't know if I have a, just magic thing or something? No. Uh, okay. Um, what we've got is, is basically, uh, in the, in the uh, current situation, we have gas-rich shell, in which the gas is tightly bound. You can't get it out just by sticking a hole in it and hoping that it'll come up. It's, you've got to break open this shell, and it's done by this incredible technology. It's really gee whiz, wow kind of technology. They're able to stick some, something down 5,000 foot, <laughs> bend the pipe, blow holes in this, put in these chemicals that help make it slip, prop open the holes with, with silica and, and, other, and sand and other kind of things, and suck out some of this gas. Let me emphasize that they do not get it all. Okay? It's some of the gas that they're getting. But I'll come back to that. You know, uh, you've seen pictures of this. Uh, this is a well pad. You can see lots of, when I look at something like this, I see lots of opportunities for things to go wrong. Right? Trucks to back up into each other. Uh, uh, and and uh, there are plenty of pictures of these kind of things happening. Uh, you've got uh, rural areas where you might have just uh, one house or two nearby this big area with, you know, the ponds for the water and, uh, that is put down and for the water that comes up. It may be in a semi-rural area. This is a more uh, uh, semi-rural semi Pennsylvania. Here's your house. Here's your drilling rig across the street. So we're doing this with more and more people nearby. We also have a situation in which lots of things can go wrong. A resources for the Future, which is a Washington think tank, was given a million dollars by a foundation to go look at what possibly could go wrong and to try to get expert elicitation as to, okay, what are the most likely things to go wrong? They came up with a list, and I think I've got the number right, of 264 things that could go wrong. Wow. That's an awful lot of things that could go wrong. Uh, have any of you remember, heard of, of Sutton's Law? Remember Willie Sutton, the bank robber? Yeah, I guess I mean. Well, Willie Sutton was a famous bank robber of uh, 50 years ago or so who, who um, uh, allegedly was asked, uh, he was a favorite of press, and allegedly, because he always was, was robbing banks, getting arrested, uh, escaping from jail, and starting over again, getting arrested again. He allegedly was asked by a reporter, Willie, why do you rob banks? And he said, yeah, that's where the money is, right? Okay. Well, it, got, it became a law in medicine. So Sutton's law is, if you've got a, say somebody comes in with, they've got a 
enlarged lymph node suddenly they've noticed? Well, the differential diagnosis of an enlarged lymph node is every kind of cancer you can think of, it's uh, every kind of immune disorder you can think of, it's lots of infectious diseases. You can spend weeks just doing all these tests to find out which one of these it, it, it is. But Sutton's law says just take the lymph node out and look at it. Okay? Do it directly. If we're worried about health and ecosystems, then if you've got 264 things that can go wrong, the way to deal with that is to look at health and look at ecosystems. And that we've been very, very slow and very reluctant to do. You all know about the hydrofracking agents. It's important. I'm going to tell you it's less important from my point of view as a toxicologist, as a physician, than the stuff that's brought up from underground. It's more than just these hydrofracking agents. There's lots of different ones they've done for the additives are used for uh, a whole bunch of different things. Usually though in any one site, any one frack, there's only about eight or so that might be used. So it's not that all of these are used all the time. Uh, you can, you know, here's just here's Hal Burton's uh, fracking uh, fluids. Uh, uh, it's a picture on a, on a site. Um, so that's sort of a background. I, you know, if there are big questions about that, I'd be happy to answer them now as to how it's done. But let me go through the health issues. This is basically, uh, you know, are people concerned about their health? So what we did is we just analyzed uh, the. Uh, uh, the two minutes that people were allowed to testify in front of Senator, uh, in front of uh, uh, President Obama's advisory commission when they had a hearing in Washington, Pennsylvania, and we looked at the 59 people who uh, testified against. We had a transcript, and we basically went through and looked at why they were concerning. You know, environmental concerns had it, okay? but health concerns are certainly there. So people are concerned, and the people who are opposed are concerned about their health. Uh, so what happened? This pre you know, here are language of executive orders that we looked at uh, that were of three committees that were established to look at the shale gas issue in 2011. One was President Obama's Blueprint for America. Another was the governor of Maryland, uh, who is a Republican, I'm sorry, a Democrat, and the other governor of Pennsylvania was a Republican. All three of them, in their executive orders, say that they really worried about the health and welfare of, system, of, of the uh, of, of, of citizens or uh, adverse impacts to public health, uh, protection of public health and the environment. This is standard language. All three asked their committees to look at that. There were 52 members of these three committees. Everybody want to guess how many people had any health background whatsoever? Yeah, yeah. Zero. Yeah. Zero. 52 people chosen to give advice on health issues as well as other issues. Zero with any health background. Now, I spent a lot of time in New Jersey. We helped, uh, uh, I came to New Jersey in 1980 with the goal of establishing a, a, at the State University an uh, environmental health program. Um, the state of New Jersey, in its wisdom, realized that it had some environmental problems that maybe the State University would act, look, look, act, look at. And, you're having the same thing here. You've got your state universities getting involved in a very positive way in trying to provide the information that you need to make decisions as citizens. Um, in New Jersey, if the governor didn't really want to find out what the health things might be, they still put a health person on the committee. It was a physician, always a male in my recollection. Uh, the, this male physician had one major attribute that put this male put Doc so-and-so on, on, on this committee that was looking at some environmental issue. Uh, he was the state treasurer, he was the treasurer of the county Republican or Democratic Party, depending on who the governor was. So this was simply, let's, oh, good old Doc so-and-so, he contributes a lot, he runs our county uh, 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 funding, uh, let's go put him on a committee. We don't have that. In none of those committees is there anyone with any health background. There were no environment. There were a lot of good environmental groups, Trout Unlimited, and National Wildlife, but not the American Lung Association, uh, uh, not any of the organizations that sort of come at this from a health point of view. Uh, Pennsylvania had seven state agencies involved in its advisory commission, not the Department of Health. Uh, Maryland did not have the Department of Health. President Obama's commission, 
the lead is given to the uh, Department of Energy with input specified by the President's uh, uh, executive order, input from the Department of Interior and from EPA, not from Health and Human Services. Interesting. Uh, in Pennsylvania, I won't talk that much more about Pennsylvania, the net result is we ended up with a tax from this commission that uh, said there ought to be a tax. We don't call it a tax, we call it an impact fee because our governor doesn't like to call anything a tax. Uh, there are 17 state agencies, sub-agencies, and commissions that get funding, not the Department of Health. Not one penny to the Department of Health. You're always, your Department of Health has some activities related to oil and gas. Ours is not. Governor doesn't want it. Governor supports uh, other things. Okay, so that's a background about not at the table. Let me talk about something about the issues, and I'm going to quickly go through this. Each of these could be a full major thing in itself. I wouldn't have included these slides except I was told that they will be distributed, so you'll have a chance to look at them later. But there's lots of uh, classic toxicological issues. You've got the hydrofracturing compounds, the flowback constituents, which include the gas uh, and, and the hydrocarbons you're looking for, and also include, include natural constituents. Lots of brine can, uh, products, lots of bromine, and um, uh, all sorts of other agents, and there's some radionuclides as well. But you've got to find out where they go and what the hazard of the individual compounds are, and whether they can, whether they're persistent, whether they might bioconcentrate, uh, what their reaction products would be, how they're going to interact with your local geology, and it's going to be different in different places of the country. We have a lot of acid mine drainage. So, you know, what do are, what are these compounds do when they hit acid and how will they change? Um, the, um, the kind of compounds we're worrying about come not just from the hydraulic fracturing chemicals. And again, I'll tell you, I'm less worried about those. Those are compounds that have to go through a fair amount of check to get into commerce. It's not that I'm not worried about them, but I'm less worried about them than these natural constituents which we bring up from below and which we pay no attention to. I, in fact, think part of the misdirection of this issue has been this big focus on the hydrofracturing chemicals and paying no attention to the natural constituents, which can include lots of things, as I say, including radionuclides, or the mixtures issue. If you're going to get exposed, you're not going to get exposed to any one of these chemicals. You're going to get exposed to a mixture, either the stuff that's put down or the stuff that's uh, brought back up. Uh, any of you took high school chemistry you might remember the term retort. You know, retort was something you put a lot of chemicals into and you heat it up. Well, it's, it's pretty hot down below there. Uh, temperatures are 400 degrees or thereabouts. Got lots of chemicals down there. You're adding these others. Um, wow. Then you're bringing them all to the surface and putting them somewhere. So I, I don't know what's good. I don't know what the chemistry is there. And I see very little attempt to try to figure out what it is. And I think we need that. Mixtures is always an issue for those of us in environmental health. The last spur to trying to figure out, to try to understand and predict what mixtures might do to us was the Superfund issues. I mean, here were these hazardous waste sites where lots of different chemicals were dumped, they were getting into groundwater, people were being exposed to a mixture that made no sense. I mean, there are certain mixtures we know about. We, we, understand, we understand what coffee does, right? Coffee's a mixture. It's got lots of things in it. It's got formaldehyde in it, naturally, for instance. I mean, there's lots of things in coffee. Um, we understand what gasoline does, because we, we know that we're all going to get exposed to it, and we better study it. So we force the study of that. But here are mixtures which we do not know what's happening. We need to understand them. There are great improvements happening in toxicology. We have molecular toxicological approaches. We're, we're entering the 21st century of better ways to test chemicals and to try to understand and predict what they might do. We need to apply that now to these mixture issues because it really is a, is a potential issue. If you look at what the pathways are that might affect our health, well, worker and community safety issues are really important. It's one thing to talk about toxicology, but you've got on the workplace, these are not, these are not the safest places to work. We've had a number of deaths in, in Pennsylvania. I know there are deaths here in, in the West. I don't even call Colorado directly. Uh, community safety issues are, are the, include the potential for explosions. You've got worker exposure. You've got community exposure to the air toxics. Um, in Pennsylvania, we have an issue, which I'm told is also an issue here. We have an issue that, uh, uh, with ozone. We almost exceed the ozone standard in lots of parts of our state. The ozone standard um, will be 
should be made more stringent in the very near future because the data showing that ozone in leads to increased mortality is now becoming, I think, much firmer than it was before. And so uh, our processes to basically set standards should make that standard more stringent. We're pretty close to exceeding that. Um, the amount of air pollution of ozone precursors that come from the kind of activities uh, that we're seeing with the Marcella shale, and you're seeing here, are substantial. Now let me step back from that to be sure. O ozone is not something that is made directly by the, by the activity. Ozone is something that is the action of sunlight on oxides of nitrogen and on hydrocarbons that come from a variety of different sources. If you've got a major plant that's going to go in, petrochemical plant or something like that, you're going to look very closely to be sure that that single plant with its emissions does not really <coughs> impact on the potential for ozone downwind. And the ozone can occur hundreds of miles downwind. But what if you've got a small facility that by itself does not exceed the kind of levels that we start worrying about for ozone? It, don't look at that. We don't bother the local dry cleaner on ozone generally. Uh, but what if you got 10,000 of them? And what we're seeing in Pennsylvania is an aggregate buildup of these ozone precursors, which carried downwind will lead parts of our state to likely exceed the ozone standard. The issue is the health effects, and the issue is the sort of ironic, if you will, I believe there's irony in this, of the fact that if you exceed the ozone standard, you have to do a state implementation plan to show how you're not going to exceed it, and usually that limits industrial development. But we've been sold the Marcellus Shell, and you've been sold the shale gas thing, on the fact that it will lead to industrial development. So, but if we, we end up with too much of these emissions that come from all sorts of things that are happening around each fracking site, including the tr diesel trucks and everything, we will end up exceeding the ozone standard. We'll cause adverse effect, health effects, and we'll limit industrial development. Uh, we've got air pollution, we've got water pollution, we've got the physical agents, the light, the noise, the radiation, explosions that can occur, and the psychosocial effects. And I want to focus a bit on psychosocial effects. Because I'm not going to be able to show you a cause and effect relationship with any sort of disease. I want to make that clear. I do not have data that would allow me to say that this fracking has led to these cancers, these adverse health effects, more kids with asthma in any place in the country. Certainly don't have it in Pennsylvania. And I don't have it, not because it doesn't exist, because I haven't been able to look at it. But we have seen psychosocial effects. And We've seen them in people who are complaining, who say, hey, I have adverse health effects because of those fracking. And so we did a study in which we interviewed these people in depth. And we did it as a preliminary to the epidemiological study that needs to be done. The study that basically has a control and basically looks or has a before and after and looks at people and sees if their health is affected. And if you do a study like that, you want to do not just, you don't want to just listen to the expert toxicologist who says, well, I'm worried about such and such disease, let's look at that. You also want to ask the community, what's bothering you? And make sure that your study includes that. So we basically interviewed the people who <coughs> believe that their health has been affected as a preliminary to that. And um, almost two years went by and nothing was happening in terms of any possibility of an epidemiological study. And industry started telling us that, well, you know, people are complaining, but that, those complaints will go away when we stop fracking. They won't see the trucks going back and forth and all the noise and whatnot, and, you know, it'll go away. So we said, well, all right, let's look at these people who we interviewed a couple of years ago to see if, in fact, uh, they're still complaining. And as far as they were concerned, they were, had as many health effects or more. They still had all these different, uh, variety of different symptoms, and I won't bother you with the details of the symptoms. Nothing different that has, that has not been seen here in Colorado uh, by, by certain groups and not been seen elsewhere in the country. Um, but again, I don't know if there's cause and effect relationship. But what happened was that we also did a social science kind of um, analytical approach to the transcripts from these hour, hour and a half long interviews where people were mostly just free talking. We didn't give them a list of symptoms and say, do you have this or that, check it off. We didn't do anything more than just start people off and talking and let them talk, tell us what they thought the problems were. And 
When you looked at what social scientists call stressors, what's bothering you? Well, here's a list of what people were saying. This is 33 people. This is the percentage of people who basically, the highest amount is denied or provided false information. Corruption, concerns, complaints ignored. Nobody's answering the telephone, being taken advantage of. You get down to the sixth one there, and it's only it's 45 percent of the people are concerned about the noise. It's really noisy if you've ever lived near any of, of these. Uh, you get down further down, uh, you get into the odors, the uh, uh, you know I'm smelling things. The, it, 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 there's light. They're, they're running around. The, the, Tom, what are bothering those people who are sure their health has been affected? are basically the lack of transparency and the lack of trust. These are things that can be corrected, should be corrected, are not being corrected, and they need to be corrected. So I will uh, pursue that a bit. I, I, what I did is I, oops. I know, jump right through your work, John. <laughs> um, so let me go to, uh, Say I was thinking of the old expression, uh, call us the Newcastle, which some of you may remember. It means basically Newcastle was this town in Britain which had all this coal uh, being done, and coal to Newcastle was, you know, it was sort of silly. Why would you bring coal to a place that had that? Uh, you're asking somebody from Pennsylvania to talk about the health effects when the best work in this issue has been done here in Colorado by the Colorado School of Public Health. John Adgate is back here, and John asked me, John uh, was polite enough to let me take some of his slides. Uh, to show you what is um, not definitive work, and he would be the first to tell you it's not definitive, and John, you can argue. It is, you know, <laughs> thank you. Uh, he was my student, so I'm biased. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what we have here is a situation in which there are so few published, peer reviewed studies of high quality that have been done, and this is one of them. Basically, what John did was to go and measure what the pollutants were uh, during uh, uh, the fracking. He looked at samples, 24 samples from near the well pad, and then samples from far enough away. And he looked, he basically used standard risk assessment approaches and uh, uh, found that there was a relationship uh, with a variety of subclinic effects and was able to go. Uh, and uh, the summary is that residents living near well completion <coughs> activities potentially exposed to substantial level of air toxics. Uh, the estimated cancer risk and the chronic non-cancer hazard indices are greater for the residents living nearer than further away. Uh, standard, good work. Uh, I don't think you can, qu I've seen lots of quarrels with this, but I haven't seen anybody quarrel with the science. I would have seen people quarreling with, you know, he should have said that uh, it, it, it's, uh, uh, instead of it's highly significant, he should have said it and only said it was uh, moderately significant, or things like that. The key issue is these are measurements, they're real measurements, they're near and far, and they show risk. Now, the risks aren't that great. Um, the benzene risk, for instance, which is pushing the cancer risk, uh, a lot of us have uh, higher benzene risks just by being, uh, having houses with attached garages. I mean, indoor air pollution benzene levels will sometimes be higher than this. So we're not dealing with an issue where we say, oh my goodness, we've got to shut this down automatically because of the benzene levels, but we are dealing with an issue where undoubtedly there's higher risk, and it's one shot on what should have been extensive air monitoring done on all of these things. Uh, a lot of good good uh, discussion by John and his colleagues, uh, Lisa McKenzie is the first author on this, about the, the limited data and the, um, um, the fact that we, don't, we, we can't really use the data to say how far is far enough away from these sites. It's going to differ depending upon your air monitoring, your natural air sheds, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, so the conclusions that he's drawn are short-term exposures are, are potentially in the range of health concern and prevention strategies should be, should be aimed at minimizing exposures. And I think that those are perfectly uh, valid conclusions. Uh, I said at the beginning that I thought the story was being managed. Let me give a couple of examples of where I think management is occurring. Uh, here are two statements which seem to be opposite to each other, right? New hydrofracturing related technology now permits extraction of gas that we've long known as trapped in the tight shale formations. I mean, I, every time I turn on the TV, uh, Range Resources is telling me that and bragging appropriately about this great new technology. 
And you're also saying that, hey, don't worry about any uh, bad problems, because we've been doing this for 60 years. We get all this experience. Well, it can't be old and new at the same time. You, you just can't say that without the public getting upset. Um, it, does it cause groundwater contamination? You have look at industry sites about this, and you'll see Lisa Jackson, uh, shown testifying in Congress, agreeing that there is no proof that hydrofracturing has ever caused groundwater contamination. And that's because the, the hydrofracturing, if it's successfully done, is released 5,000 foot underground, and your groundwater is perhaps 100, 150, 200 foot underground. Okay. Well, imagine you're a resident of a Western Pennsylvania, and you open the newspaper, you see that, and you also see the fact that the folks in Dimmock or one of the other towns is now on a bottle of water because there's hydrofracturing chemicals in their water supply. How can that be? Well, it is because but industry is defining hydrofracturing as being the successful release of chemicals 5,000 foot underground. And the fact that Dimmock or other towns has hydrofracturing chemicals in there is because, well, the well casing broke, or the truck turned over, or the pond leaked. Uh, that's technical. That is basically misleading people. The question that we have as citizens is, you're going to be here for 20 years, you say? Is my groundwater going to get contaminated? I don't care whether it comes up from underground, it comes because the truck rolls over, it comes because the casing isn't right. Are you going to contaminate my groundwater? And the answer is, yeah, there's a risk. And to, so to go through this thing, well, there's no evidence that this has ever occurred, where you're talking about a special subset of the question, which is successful release 5,000 foot underground, is really misleading and inappropriate, and leads to the kind of problems. And I'm not making this up. This is the head of our state department of environmental protection saying there has been a misconception that the hydraulic fracturing of wells can or has caused contamination of water wells. This is false. No, it's not. Uh, hydraulic fracturing is only a temporary feature of natural gas development, which only lasts a few weeks. Yeah, per frac. But in our area, they're doing 8, 10, 12 fracks on each set. They have wells going in different directions. So, you know, if you're a family, uh, this is going on near you, you say, well, okay, I can handle two weeks. Uh, you know, I'll send the rest of the family off to grandma's house or something in two weeks. What's, you know, so what? But they don't tell you it's two weeks, then it's two weeks again, then it's two weeks again, and so you get 12 times two weeks, you're talking about half a year. Wow. Uh, these are the kind of misleading statements. The hydraulic fracturing of wells is not new. We've been doing it in Pennsylvania for the longest time. Eh, not important. Um, the transparency issue. Uh, there's a, the industry has agreed to be transparent in Colorado law to let the way great triumph of allowing, of making sure that the chemicals that were used in hydrofracturing are known to the local residents. You can find out what chemicals they're using near you, except if it's confidential business information. Right? I'll talk about that in a bit. But they don't have to tell you anything at all about the stuff they're bringing up from underground. I, again, I'm much more worried about what's being brought up from underground, which includes the hydrofracturing, hydraulic fracturing fluid, than what's being put deep under underground and staying there. Okay? Um, this 1%, I'll go back to the transparency issue, but the, this issue of the statements that, can, that this, this cannot be harmful because it's only 1%, uh, the hydraulic fracturing fluid is only 1% of the total. Gosh, 1% is an enormous amount. I, benzene is 1% of gasoline. A lot of our rules about gasoline and cutting down the amount of benzene and gasoline and putting cuffs on the, as we pump the gas is to cut down on the risk of benzene. The allowable drinking water standard for benzene uh, is five parts per billion, okay? Five parts per billion, 1% is the equivalent of 10 million parts per billion. So we don't, you know, that's a two million fold dilution and you're still not met the standard. 1% is a lot. And to a toxicologist, when I hear that, I just get furious. <laughs> Tell me 1% is not an issue. Okay. Here's an example of the kind of problems we run into with this, this, this lack of transparency. As I said, I do things down in the Gulf. Uh, how many of you have heard about the dispersant that was used in unprecedented amount? Okay. How many of you know that there was a, uh, there was a, um, uh, one of the components, uh, organic sulfonic acid salt was proprietary, confidential business information. This is the material safety data sheet you were told about. If I asked an audience in the Gulf, have you heard of, did you know about that? Everybody would raise their hand. If I asked them, did it worry you, the fact that this is secret, there's something there, everybody would raise their hand. I then make 
you quit, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many of you have ever taken an over-the-counter laxative? <laughs> That's what this is. This is what this compound turns out to be. It's the commonest over-the-counter laxative. It, it breaks up the oil-water interface, right? I mean, it's a bad way to get a laxative. Uh, so, I, you know, as a toxicologist, you tell me that there's a potential for exposure to this. Uh, you know, that's not the biggest thing to worry about. There's probably a million doses of it taken every day by the public. We don't know of any problems. I'm not sure what it does to the, the fish of the sea. Uh, but, uh, you know, so why are you not telling us about this? Your competitors know what it is. And if they don't, it'll cost them 10 bucks worth of analytical equipment to find out. Why are you keeping this secret? Why are you adding to the stress of this overstressed Gulf community, which has already got Katrina and now the Deepwater Horizon, they're out of work, they've got all these problems, and you're stressing them out further by claiming that, that you've got to keep this secret? And I think that's part of the transparency issue. I think that there's almost no reason whatsoever for most of the trans most of these things that they say are confidential business information. Uh, let me go into what Colorado was started. We copied in Pennsylvania it was exactly the confidential business information. Uh, I think this is a failure of, in, of environmental organizations to some extent. At the table when this was discussed, there were a lot of better environmental organizations. They really don't understand health and medicine and really should have had some of the uh, health and medicine folks in there. Uh, if, if I'm a physician and I think, you know, there's a kid who, there's a family, uh, one of the kids is just not doing well. And they live right next to this creek where there's lots of hydraulic fracturing on it. And, you know, I probably, we've all had kids maybe went through this ourselves in which, you know, the kid's got lots of headaches, not doing well in school, uh, cranky, whatever it is. And you were, I wonder if there's something going on with the kids always playing in the creek. I wonder if it's something to do with the, the hydraulic fracture. And then you go to the doc. And the doc says, well, I'll get the list of the chemicals. And it says, oh, there's a confidential one there. I, I better get that information too. Okay. Well, the doc then goes to his lawyer because he's got to sign this form. And if the lawyer knows anything, the lawyer should say, well, you know, if you sign this form, you can be sued for the total value of this confidential secret. Halliburton claims that their secrets are worth $200 million. And by the way, Doc, um, your malpractice doesn't cover this, and you're going to have to hire your own lawyers. And, and by the way, if you do find that maybe this is responsible for headaches or for whatever symptoms they have that you think it could be, you're, by state law, required to tell the public health, the state health department, and if you do, and if they release the information, it's not clear since you're the source of it whether you'll get sued. Okay? Thank you, Colorado, for this real helpful way of dealing with this issue. No, what, what physician's going to do that? I mean, actually, there are a few starting it based, based upon doing this as, as, as an approach to try to deal with uh, uh, changing the way the law goes. But this is not a serious attempt to give confidence to, to basically allow physicians to deal with these issues. Um, plus, it benefits the industry. Now think about it. There's something called frac focus, where industry, it's an industry-run um, website which has all the chemicals that are, that are being done. Okay. They started out with over 400 chemicals when I first did this slide. Uh, uh, they have 500 and some odd now. What did you say the number was? 569 or something like that? Okay, so imagine the same situation. Uh, somebody's got some symptoms, comes to the physician. Or I get, you know, I'm the expert, I get referred to it. Um, and I go and look at this list of 559 chemicals to see if any of them can do it. I guarantee you there is no symptom, there is no disease that you can think of that one of those chemicals is not a, potentially related to. There's just too many of them. If you, on the other hand, come to me and say, well, here's somebody that got symptoms and they got some illness, and here are six chemicals that they might have been exposed to, I could legitimately say, well, we know something about those chemicals, and don't worry, whatever is causing this, you'd better evaluate it because it's not coming from those chemicals. So it's an in industry's at best interest to be able to say, hey, we'll just tell you about the sex because then they can, you know, they can cut down on the likelihood that people are going to think it's their fault. So let's not try to celebrate that. And then we get this, what I call environmental recidivism. Um, this is the language in Pennsylvania. I'm told it's after Colorado. I tried to find the language later today, and I couldn't confirm this, but I'm pretty sure this is also in Colorado. Um, right after the thing on confidential business information, there's this language that says, notwithstanding any other provision of this chapter, 
you, we don't have to tell you anything about stuff that were not intentionally added, that occur incidentally, unintentionally present in trace amounts, incidental result of a chemical reaction, or constituents of naturally occurring materials. That's, that's bringing us back 50 years. This is, this is equivalent to um, Dow Chemical not having to tell us about Agent Orange containing dioxins. The dioxins were not there intentionally. They were there in trace amounts. They were there as part of a chemical reaction that was unexpected and unwanted. This is equivalent to saying that that wallboard manufacturer with the, the phosphorus and the gypsum doesn't have to tell us about the naturally occurring radioactivity in there. They happen to have a lot of it because, after all, it's naturally occurring. No, this is wrong. You don't do this. You don't basically say, in your law, you guys got to buy, you don't have to tell us about these chemicals. That, remember, this is what you're bringing up from underground and you're having to put somewhere. Okay. One of the problems we have is where are the data coming from that are starting to appear? The exposure and ecological effects studies are underway with cooperating industry, more power to them. But there's the issue of the safety culture. And we try to make a distinction between accident and incident in public health. This is an accident. This is the comet about to hit the deep water horizon. Right? This is, you know, I've got graduate students who can do these kind of things for me. <laughs> <laughs> this is not an accident. This is an incident. This is fully preventable. And what we see over and over again is a wide range of safety culture in these companies. Here's some study, a study we did. We just took the state, the, the state of Pennsylvania's uh, uh, website, uh, looking at the violations. We took uh, the companies. Uh, we found 36 companies that had 10 or more uh, shale wells. And we just looked at how many violations they had uh, per company per well. And there's a half dozen companies, and, and if you want, if you want, it, it's on the, something called Frack Tracker. It's got lots of good information. It's got the names of the companies. I've taken the names out because, to me, the issue isn't the name so much as the wide range that we see it. There's a half dozen companies here which have never had a violation. There's another half dozen at the other end which have, what, twice as many violations as they have wells. Until we control that, we're in problem. And if we're going to get our data as to what is being released into the air or into the water, only from these cooperative companies, because I guarantee you these companies aren't cooperating, that data is really suspect. It's the, you know, industry has it, has it right when they say that it's unfair that they get blacklisted uh, because of the uh, actions of bad actors. Uh, again, uh, th those of us who've been involved in safety cultures for industry uh, in this kind of area, uh, it, it, if you would have told me that this uh, oil uh, platform was a fire and 11 people died in the Gulf of Mexico and said, guess which company, I would have guessed BP. They were notoriously bad in terms of safety culture. They're a big company. So one of the things we're hearing is, well, the big companies are now taking over, and this is going to happen. It's going to be good, com be good things will happen because the big companies are taking over. I, we need real rigorous oversight. We need an acceptance of only zero in terms of the safety issues that, are, uh, that we're dealing with here. And again, go back to 260, whatever that number is, of, of potential things that can go wrong. We need more than just simply a checklist approach. We need an overall safety culture approach. I mentioned this about the psychosocial impacts. You go into the literature, no surprise, you will find documentation after documentation that the people, it, that if you don't trust the source of information, you will perceive the risk as being higher. It's been found with the nuclear industry, it's been found with GMOs, it's been, you just, just name it. Trust is a very large part of, of your perception of how, how dangerous it is to you and your family. We need to work on this issue because we can do things about these transparency issues. We can do things about answering the phone when people complain. We can be responsive if we basically say, no, it's impossible for any problem to occur. That's not going to happen. So I'm going to tell you that there's four certainties. I'm going to tell you that there's surprises. I mean, this is really, it's a rapidly moving technology. There's always surprises. I, I've had the, the fun in, 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 I've been talking about this uh, since I started getting involved in it, and I've been 
given credit for having predicted the earthquakes in Ohio, which is where we were shipping our thing. No, I didn't predict the earthquakes in Ohio, I just predicted there'd be surprises. Uh, it's nice to get every once in a while be told that you predicted something that, that worked out. Uh, th this is going to happen. There will be clusters. And by clusters, what we mean is that there is suddenly a, a gosh, you notice that there's a bunch of kids in our community who have leukemia or autism or adults who have pancreatic cancer, and it seems to be a bunch together. Now, most of the time we evaluate these. I mean, this, this is an important part of what we do in environmental health, and most of the time we find that there's no real cause and effect relationship. It's statistical variety, variability. It's as if I asked you all to start flipping coins, and uh, you know, there's enough people in the room, you'll get 10 heads in a row pretty quickly, uh, just in you know, the scheme of things. But when this occurs now in all these different communities, you can bet that at least one of these things, somebody's going to point and say, you know, we didn't have these kids with autism until they put up those damn rigs. And what will happen then is, what, there'll be media attention, there'll be lawsuits, the state health department will be called in to try to make some sense out of it, and it's too late at that point. There won't be any comparison group uh, to, to basically make sense out of these things because there's no other place, there's no other place that's been studied. We need to have the mechanisms to deal with this or we're going to have all these problems, uh, psychosocial disruption, and we'll have less pollution over time. I mean, industry is getting better and better at what they're doing. They don't want their casings to blow. They sell, they buy the hydrofracking chemicals, so they'd like to use less of it and recycle it. They sell us what they bring up from below, so they'd rather not have the methane go out. They'd rather sell it. They'd rather not have the benzene be released because they can sell it. Um, that's going to happen. This won't happen. This is, I just looked at Colorado, so you know when he was coming to talk. Uh, this is uh, an article in Bloomberg News saying Colorado proposes fracking regulations. Uh, Colorado, where hydraulic fracturing has helped push oil production to the highest level, is considering legislation to rein in the practice, drawing threats from drillers who say they will flee the state if the restrictions become law. Nonsense. Yeah, temporarily they may go in and out. But the gas is there. If it, you know, I start with a belief, and some of you may disagree with me, that we're going to drill it. And if you start with that as a belief that we're going to drill it, then they're not going away. They're going to drill it. And in the long run, it would be better if they did wait. What's the rush? When we, as toxicologists, will get the development of a new drug. So there's a disease out there. There's a drug that could cure that disease. It's being developed. We go through a whole series of tests to be sure it isn't toxic, that it really works. It is a tragic thing to be the last person who would die uh, because that drug was not quite approved in time for you to be able to be cured by it. But once that drug is approved, we got it. It's there. It's part of our armamentarium. What we have here instead is something which is available to us for 20 years, 30 years, 10 years, different numbers out there. Let's say it's 20 years. What's the difference between starting at year three and going to year 23, as opposed to starting at year zero and going to year 20. And I could come up with differences. It's certainly a problem if I've got a lease and I'm a drilling company and I've got to drill within five years, but that's their problem. That's not our problem as a society. Why is it that we're in such a rush to do this so quickly? And I would argue that the recommendation that I would give the five-letter, one-syllable word, is stall. Industry is getting better at building its wells. They're better at recycling. They're better at doing things that there'll be less problems. And also, to go back to that beginning statement I made about you don't get all the gas, industry is getting better and better at getting the gas. In our area, in the Northeast, what we're dealing with is the state of New York, which is basically stalling. They've agreed to frack, but they've, you know, they're waiting now. They're doing a health evaluation, and they're waiting. And it's, uh, in Pennsylvania, we're running ahead. The same amount of, if you will, Marcellus shale containing gas below a plot in Pennsylvania that's being drilled now, less of the gas will come out than will happen in New York. We in Pennsylvania are going to make less money than the folks in New York because they're going to get more gas because the technology is getting better. So you, if you believe that, that this is just a money thing, and you believe we really need the gas, we'll get more gas if we stall. 
but we certainly will do the health and safety better if we stall. So, again, that, that's the summary of what I've told you. Stall. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, some of you, I think, are just starting to write on your questions, so there will be people walking around to get... <clears throat> okay. If I lower my voice for that, I was going to ask you whether I... Me to listen to you. I don't know. I was very tempted to ask you for... I do have Sudafed here. Should I take it, doctor? Could you recommend it I'm for a better treatment? I don't know. I think it's better. It's I'm not licensed to practice in the state of Colorado. I'm like the lawyer is sitting there saying, no, you should dare answer that question. Okay, well, thank you. I trying to go drug free, but... But I'll All these you. <laughs> discussions of chemicals are kind of creating the first year for. <clears throat> okay, so I don't have too many here yet, but I can get us started. <clears throat> that seems to make me worse to smell. It. <clears throat> okay, so I have. Do you want me to read? I'm going to do it. Okay. I'll get it. it my, Ten sessions, eleven sessions, and I have done this, so I'm <laughs> going to keep it up here. Um, okay, so I'm I'm going to ask a couple of questions first about, uh, well, really several about studies. Do you believe that peer review is being ignored by health risk professionals and is the process transparent and robust? Um, so is there something going on? Which it's, an inter it's an interesting question. The issue of peer review is a fascinating one. Um, we believe strongly in peer review. We uh, uh, serve in a lot of National Academy of Sciences committees. We extensive peer review. Uh, anything that the publication that I mentioned that, jo uh, that John published or the studies that I showed you of our own have all gone through peer review. But peer review is not our golden point. I mean, I, I've, as a reviewer, basically sent a note off to, a, to an editor saying, you know, I think this is probably wrong, but I'm not sure why, and it's so important, you really got to publish it. Because if it is right, it's so meaningful. Our golden standard is replication. <coughs> peer review is just the first level through. So what we really want is replication. If John finds something in Colorado and I find it in, 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 in Pennsylvania, that's the kind of replication we want. It's not the same people uh, you know, coming up with the same thing. That's where we are in science, which means we need multiple studies, which means we're always running into problems with the management folks who want nice, clean, only one person does it, and we don't want duplication of effort. We need duplication of effort. The, the other aspect of this, though, which I wonder if this is where the, the question is going, is has to do with there's a push now uh, in um, uh, Congress by the Tea Party to basically say uh, uh, EPA's uh, uh, review processes are flawed because EPA's people who are funded by EPA are allowed to be on review committees uh, for EPA science. Uh, now, you're not allowed to be on a review committee if it's your own studies or if it's a study directly related to your own stuff, but you are if it's a, a different study. Or they, you're still an expert in the area. Um, and so there's a bill in Congress uh, 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 from the House, from the House Space Science and Technology Committee, or Science, Space, and Technology Committee, which basically says uh, uh, it's okay for as many industry people as you want on there as long as there isn't their own industry being reviewed. But any EPA, anybody who's ever been funded by EPA to do science is not allowed to be on a peer review committee. That's bizarre and is completely <laughs> antithetical to what we would normally want to do. We've worked very hard through the years, and I, 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 started, in a, I started in the Reagan administration, to make sure we have peer review of everything that EPA goes through. That's science. And the big push, as far as I'm concerned, is to make sure the economic analyses are, are as rigorously peer-reviewed as if you were the laboratory science and the, uh, the atmospheric science kind of work that EPA does. But there's excellent peer review at EPA, and uh, I'm very frightened of this attempt in Congress to try to uh, uh, dictate what Congress thinks ought to be the peer review process. Um, I'm going to take a, this is great, I, my voice is back here, and I want to just take a, a word here. I don't know how that happened. I think just the mention of your <laughs> wife instead of telling me here, just knowing that someone could help me. But I want to push just a little bit further because professions do have operating assumptions, and they do hold to those. And when I was a girl, we all had to read Thomas Kuhn's. Um, structure of scientific revolutions mm. because there is a standing, a conventional wisdom that a profession adopts. Do you see any of that in, in the appraisal of public health studies? And in this, for well, sure. I mean, stand, stand, you know, this is uh, all the things that we do are being subject to peer review. We, we, we all right, let me do it this way. Let me describe a situation at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, 
we uh, we had a, when I was dean we set up a center for healthy environments and communities. Um, uh, the person running was mostly dealing with air pollution issues in communities, water pollution issues in communities, and along came this Marcella Shell issue. And he got really upset about it and basically started saying that this was a public health emergency. And I was not involved in it at the time, and I basically pulled him aside, and it's not a public health emergency. The public health emergency is the dam's about to break. But this is a public health issue that we need to get involved in. Uh, he was so excited and so concerned about this that he went out very publicly with these statements and never published anything in the peer review literature. It was very easy to basically say, you're an advocate and lose the value of a university, which is to go through peer review, to do it the hard way, to get the information out. Uh, now, ethically, if in fact in public health we see that there's an emergency and people aren't responding, we ought to get out and advocate. But in this situation, which there certainly exists with fracking, that there are a lot of effective advocates out there. I mean, Josh Fox is out here. I mean, you know, how more effective can you be than that? Our job at the universities is to go through the good science, to have that good science available, to realize that this issue isn't going away. It's going to be around for 10, 20 years. And what you need are superb, documented, scientific information that the scientific community will agree on that you can then build your regulations in a way that, uh, you know, has impact. And we've seen that over and over again working in, in throughout the history of environmental health in, the, in our country, and we're seeing it working now. I mean, I'm, I'm very proud to be part of a, an NSF-funded uh, Beyond Advisory Committee, something that uh, Joe Ryan has here in developing uh, um, the, the, the kind of information that is needed on shale gas that will develop over the years being done at a state university. A good place to do it. it. Ought to be responsive to what you need. But we need the processes involved, and we're not going to get anywhere. Okay, uh, here's a question that I think was written early, and you may have clarified this as you went, but you said um, as a, to health effects that data does exist, but we are not able necessarily to see the patterns or the meaning in that, um, and you have said that few good studies have been done, or few studies that would be reliable. Is that, why is that the case? Is that the case? Well, why is that the case? Uh, I'm, part of the issue with data uh, is that uh, <laughs> uh, the data is being, made, being not made publicly available. So, for instance, I mentioned Frac Focus is this industry database where you have over 500 chemicals. They now started to put on it the, you know, a lot of the industry is putting, uh, whether they're required or not, putting those chemicals in those locations that they're, uh, they're, they're actually fracking with. But it's being put into a, into a database that is not searchable. And there are quotes from industry saying, we don't want this to be searchable. So basically, I, I mean, I, that's nice you've got that. It's good for the individual you know, person to know what the chemicals were in the nearby site. But to basically say, but we don't want the scientific community, we don't want anyone. And these days, in terms of searching these databases, uh, I, I put a 16-year-old over most of my faculty in terms of the ability to just basically go through these databases and find out what's happening. You can't do it. It's in PDF formats. It's in formats which are just simply not searchable. Intention. Sure. Uh, you've talked about potential problems and potential risks, and this person is wondering why we wouldn't have a set of case studies and examples and things to look at from if fracking has been going on since 1947, wouldn't we have actual problems and accidents from um, thousands of fracturing operations? That we could yeah, that, that's a good, good question. Uh, so there's a couple of answers. One is uh, the technology is really much different now than it was from 60 years ago. Uh, we're some of my industry friends got really upset in, in the congressional testimony. I, I basically said, you know, it, it, that, that kind of argument saying that, that the stuff from 50 years ago is something that we should be, is pertinent to now, is similar to saying that, uh, well, a firecracker and a hand grenade are both the same technology, and so uh, we shouldn't worry anymore about a hand grenade than we do about a firecracker. I, you know, I mean, this is the pressures are enormously higher. The volumes it used to be 50,000 gallons they frack with now they're fracking with five million gallons. Uh, what they're using, the chemicals they're using, the, the, even those chemicals are changing all the time. Uh, so I, you can't deal with that in that way. Further. We are having a situation in which this is moving almost inexorably from places which have almost no population to places which are pretty heavily populated. So you're getting more and more people potentially at risk. You're having situations in which uh, some states, Colorado among them, are relatively well blessed by having underground injection 
being something that you can use to immediately get rid of the fluid, although what happens between the time it comes up and the time it gets back down is still a concern. In Pennsylvania, we can't do underground injection. Our geology doesn't permit it. Uh, so again, I, I, you know, we worry more about, as I say, what comes out from underground, what are we going to do with it? We tried first to put it into publicly owned treatment works, that failed, then we put it into uh, uh, Ohio, and that failed because of earthquakes, and so now we're scurrying around what to do with it. To say that that past experience with 50,000 gallons in a straight shot is relevant is simply not, not appropriate. Okay, uh, these are two questions that would be uh, about placing this health risk in a different, in a comparative context with other health risks. Why are studies of health risk unable to put risk in context, or are they, in fact, unable? For radiation, x-rays are used to compare risks. What could be done to compare oil and gas risk? And in that, I guess, to go to a zone of human experience where health troubles seem to agglomerate, uh, um, is part, where would you put poverty in here? Is Absolutely. Uh, you know, but we have a lot of problems when we try to do comparative risk. Uh, gosh, I've been involved in this a long time. Uh, if I were to tell you that a risk is no worse than driving from here to Denver, uh, your response would be maybe for you, you're a lousy driver. I'm a good driver, that's not my risk. <laughs> if I would tell you that it's, you know, I don't know how many of you hang glide, I'm a you know, boulder, I'm assuming that this is some, some of you folks hang glide. That's a personal voluntary risk, using a comparison there. We get into all sorts of problems with comparisons. There are valid comparisons, and they can be done with sensitivity. But basically, I didn't have hydrofracturing before. I've got it now. What difference is that going to make to my, to my health? And don't tell me about other things. I think it's, it's, it's absolutely valid for those of us in southwest Pennsylvania to say, well, if you to do a comparison of what difference it might mean to our health if we had the data, which we don't have, and compare it to what to the advantages that we would have if we get, change those coal-fired power plants to um, uh, uh, natural gas-fired power plants. If we did, I can now I can now take that and give you numbers into decimal places as to what the expected risk might be. How many fewer people will die? How many years of life would be saved if we had these fewer amount of particulates? We've got all that data. I don't have the data on the other side to do the comparison. And until I get that data. How do I make a comparison? Huh. Huh. Well, actually, there is a question here that I was taking out from the stall question. If we stall, which actually we were just going directly there, if we stall, what health impact would ensue from coal, et cetera, usage? Assuming that solar energy or wind, et cetera, will not be a major energy source in the next few years, what health effects will result in continued use of coal and oil, et cetera, rather than fracked gas? Yeah, I, I think it's a very valid question. In other words, it, you know, I use the argument of, well, if we waited three years and went uh, 20 years longer, um, I, uh, well, you know, the counter argument is going to be, well, what, what if, uh, what's the uh, availability of gas for uh, in replacing coal, and how would you put factor that in there? That's a legitimate question. But we're not asking those questions. We're not thinking of this in terms of a sustainability approach. And I cut off the end of my talk on sustainability. But th th this is the long-term issues. What do we mean by sustainability? How do we get ourselves to be in a sustainable state in terms of our environment, in terms of our energy use, in terms of public health, in terms of the ecosystems that we, we depend upon and love so much? How do we get this all together? And we're simply not thinking. We're just reacting and, you know, we're going to make some money and let's go in there and uh, anybody who's opposed to it is, is just simply, uh, you know, getting in the way of, of curing all these wonderful things. We need a comprehensive approach we're not getting it. This, uh, interesting, the reverse is the uh, risk issue and how we would define risk and how we would define safe. So fracking opponents often demand that widespread fracking stop until it is proven safe. From a public health perspective, what could this mean in practice, since the certainty of no harm ever is impossible? Is it a reasonable demand to have things proven safe, and if so, how would we implement that demand? Yeah, you know, we, there's something called the precautionary principle, I understand is something that Boulder has considered and looked at, uh, which basically says uh, the burden of proof of safety is on those who are going to make money or uh, are advocating something. Um, I, I, I've never, I mean, for public health, you never think in terms of safety in terms of an absolute. Uh, one of the problems we have in toxicology is we talk about safety factors when we mean protective factors. 
But you need the information to be able to make the trade-offs. And if you don't have the information to be able to consider what we mean by safe, then you're in, 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 you just simply can't do it. I mean, we have all sorts of de minimis risk. Uh, the benzene levels that will cause a risk of one in a hundred million um, are, are risks that we don't, you know, uh, I would, I, we could argue whether we mean safety is zero or we'd accept one in a hundred million as de minimis, to use a legal term. Um, that's, that's an argument which I'm not going to get into I'm, from my point of view. One in a hundred million is a perfectly safe uh, thing. I'm not, I, so I, I, I think that's sort of a, not, not a reasonable argument to get into. Um, a couple of things about transport from lower, um, from the depths, extremely toxic substances, such as, how they have, it's partly me being in the humanities and it's partly handwriting, blue to something high? Good, good aldehyde, probably. There you are. Okay. Yeah. Um, if, 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 even if um, they were put a mile deep or utilized a mile deep safely and successfully, do they have, and then there's a fill in the blank, percentage chance of ending up in gas and water over centuries and, or decades? Yeah, I don't think good aldehyde will be over centuries. It's too reactive. But that's the problem with it. It is reactive. Uh, and there's some of these chemicals that they're using are pretty reactive. They can be used safely. We use them safely all the time in a variety of processes. Glutaraldehyde is, if I look at that list, uh, you know, is among the chemicals I'd least like to be exposed to. Uh, and, and, and I will tell you, by the way, that most toxicological evaluation of glutaraldehyde, which has been thoroughly tested, uh, comes out pretty negative. It surprises me because I look at that structure and, and worry about it. Uh, could you discuss the radioactive materials which may be delivered to the surface as well as wrapped? Yeah. Um, the, these these uh, shale are ancient seabeds. Uh, uh, they've got all the brine in, and they've got a lot of naturally occurring radioactivity. Um, the radioactivity levels are not that high when you start, but there are all sorts of ways of doing what we call technically enhanced naturally occurring radiation. So I'm mostly worried about the workers. You. Uh, have, uh, say, fine particles in, down there that will come up. They tend to have some radioactivity in them, not much compared to background. But if the, the, the blade of some turbine that's bringing this stuff up gets coated with them and some worker's got to pull them off and cake, you know, as this cake, that's pretty hot stuff. In the oil and gas industry, uh, the oil industry, uh, that's been an issue that's been known for years. And you all know about the Halliburton loophole for the Clean Water Act, uh, where the industry's out. There's also a buy. They don't have to do the kind of things that we'd have to do in a hospital if uh, there was that much radiation around there. They're exempt from it. Uh, the radiation, other part of the radiation issue is what might it do to you and I? And uh, there's the, the there's a number of scenarios that, that concern people. The one that probably is, gets the most uh, substance is one that says, well, every time you're burning natural gas in your home, uh, say to cook something, uh, there's a little bit of radon in there. It doesn't, of course, burn. It will get into the home and contributes to the radon levels within the home. Um, right now, the Northeast, which is where most of the data comes from, or most of the, the modeling of what might happen comes from, Right now, the Northeast and New York the metropolitan area, for instance, gets natural gas from Louisiana. Uh, it's in the pipeline, perhaps, say, 12 days. Um, the half-life of radon, I think we remember, is 3.5 days or something like that. So it, there's about three half-lives involved. Well, that's one-eighth the activity of the radon from what it started out to where it finally gets. Uh, so you've lost a lot of the radioactive punch. Now, if it came from Scranton to New York, it would presumably be only be in a pipeline for two or three days. You'd end up with a much higher amount of radon. Somebody has modeled this, found him Resnikoff, look it up, and basically said there'll be uh, literally thousands more lung cancer deaths uh, due to radon in the New York metropolitan area if we're going to get our gas from Scranton. Um, industry has immediately opposed it, uh, said it's wrong. Uh, but the basic issue, as far as I'm concerned, is I don't know how much radon's coming out and getting into these pipelines. We just aren't given the data to speak of. So Resnikoff's got a couple of pieces of data from a couple of times that it got measured. The industry's got some other ones that from, and they turn out to be lower. Uh, and again, it's one of these things which is a real issue, but I need data. How does the community force the industry to stop? Well, you know, it's our usual processes of uh, working through uh, whatever uh, 
uh, political process. We have politicians are very good at stalling, as we all know. <laughs> New, York, New York State has basically been stalling. I mean, they, they keep on finding reasons not to do this because there's tremendous political pressure put on the governor and the legislature. And if that political pressure wasn't there, they'd have started uh, doing this by now. So, I, you know, I, I, you, you folks have a reputation for being a, a city that knows how to do activism. <laughs> <laughs> Give you recommendations how to do it. Uh, here's where we should speak with complete frankness and not have any sensitivities about who's hosting you here. Is there adequate attention to public health in the CU fracking study, which would be us, you're your host, but do not let that shape your response in any way. Who else could or should be involved? And we'll welcome any thoughts you have on Well, I, I got an easy way to duck that. The, the committee, I first get to sit down and do the advisory process and look over their shoulder tomorrow. So ask me tomorrow night. <laughs> well, I will. Um, so I have a, a couple of questions I wanted to ask. I think there are people's, people's minds that well, this one is on my mind. Isn't there a big difference between BP onshore and BP offshore in that in that company's work and reputation, or is that something that I picked no, up? No, BP is a fascinating company. Uh, their uh, CEO a number of years ago, before the uh, the CEO the uh, Lord uh, Tony Hayward. No, but Tony Hayward, Hayward was the guy when oh, Lord the Lord Lord was his name. Yeah, Lord what's his name? Uh, that guy. Uh, when he was CEO, he took the company and made it into an energy company and started wind programs and solar programs, not just oil, and was the darling of the environmentalist. Well, but those of us who were involved in health and safety kept saying, but he's blowing up his plants. I mean, the plants are blowing up. The people in Alaska, um, uh, Alaska and Texas both. Yeah, and, and, and uh, who, uh, my wife we spent many years in Alaska and we had dinner with uh, um, Tony Knowles' uh, uh, Commerce Secretary. Yeah, and, uh, basically she made the point that of the seven uh, uh, oil companies up there, BP was always the hardest to, to get to do the things that needed to be done to protect uh, the environment. Uh, so, I, you know, this, this is an un unusual. I mean, years ago I went to seven different oil refineries at the behest of the benzene cracking company to see how they were handling the occupational health of it. And there was a wide variety of it. And there was no relationship between my respect for their central office and what was actually happening in the plants. I mean, it's, 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 some of them were getting that point of uh, safety culture down to the local community, some were not. When I present this in the Gulf, uh, I show the data from Alcoa. Uh, Paul O'Neill, who's now involved in the fracking issue in, Marcellus, uh, in, in the Marcellus area, Paul O'Neill is the former Secretary of uh, Treasury, was at Alcoa. He's an engineer, believes there should be zero effects. And uh, when we trained occupational medicine residencies, one of the things I would tell them before they go off and look for jobs is that you've got to ask the company what happens to the manager of a plant if they've got an OSHA violation. And if the, if the if nothing happens, if no bonus is affected, then you don't want to work at that place. Well, O'Neill, if they had an OSHA violation at a plant, he fired the guy. Period. Well, he drove at some number like 1.86 per 200,000 hours, uh, one of these usual occupational health issues, uh, measures. Down, it, the, Alcoa is now at 0 0.07 from 1.86, which was below the national average at the time he started. You can do it. But you got to fire people, you got to be tough, and you got to make sure that this is your first thing. His response, I just don't know about the Deepwater Horizon, his response was, well, the key point to him was somewhere in the testimony there were are folks there saying, you know, I thought it was unsafe. And his feeling is that if one person in your workforce thinks it's unsafe, you stop, period, until you straighten that out, until you convince that worker it's safe. We need that kind of culture, and we're not getting it. Uh, that was my next question. How to improve the safety culture? And I, I, my own thought is that all of the subcontractors really complicate that. Oh yeah, you got that absolutely, absolutely. The subcontractor issue. Uh, I mentioned benzene before. Uh, if you, uh, I, very often we get referred people who've got leukemia working at uh, refineries. Uh, the industry says, well, our leukemia rates are no different than anyone else's, but it turns out that these people aren't part of the industry workforce, they're subcontractors. So, you know, let's say you're a maintenance, uh, you're, you clean up at one of these places, you're a subcontract cleaning up, and there's 50 valves somewhere in there that could leak benzene. 
and the leak rate is once a year. Okay. Once a week, one of these valves is leaking somewhere. The worker nearby that valve is going to get a week worth of exposure. The cleanup person goes to every one of these every week. They get 50 weeks of exposure. The millwrights who've got to fix the valve, they're subcontracted also. They're fixing leaky valves all the time. They're the ones who get leukemia. But they're not part of the workforce of the company. They're the subcontractor's workforce. That's a terrible problem, and it's happening certainly in Pennsylvania with the Marcellus Shell. We're getting uh, uh, lots of people who are subcontractors. They're coming up. They're leaving. Um, uh, they're getting hurt. and We, don't, we just don't, we have no way to follow up on, on seeing what the problems are long term. Well, that's, I guess my, my feeling was that I wasn't entirely sure what the regulatory action or structure is that you would see as a way to enhance safety culture or, or do something about that great range that you showed there. Um, hope, hope well, is, I guess. You, you, you start with a regulatory oversight that's intense. I mean, we all read about this plant in West Texas that blew up. One of the things that, that took, you know, that just lit up for me in reading the uh, New York Times account was that the last time OSHA had inspected this plant was 23 years ago. Uh, as of a few years ago, and it's been a while since I've seen the number, there were 10 times more people doing uh, wildlife inspections of, you know, fishing and hunting inspections in this country than there were doing workplace inspections. We simply have to be in there and, and, and looking and making sure we don't just, you know, oh, bad, bad, that, that we really come in there hard and if people violate things, they get, they get hurt. Uh, the companies get hurt, not the, not the workers. Um, I have a couple of questions about stress, and one of them involves something that's come up in this series about whether having um, a growth and export of natural gas from the United States, how that adds to the stress if the resource is being produced for export to, to Japan, to another, another nation, how does that shape the psychosocial response to natural gas production? You know, people are angry about that. Uh, there are people who are really in, in Pennsylvania are really upset about because they've been sold the idea this is natural gas independence, and now you know we had a plant in Philadelphia that was supposed to be for importing liquefied natural gas. Now it's being turned around to export it. Uh, Deborah Rogers, who some of you may have heard, who's a, a financial analyst, who basically says the whole thing's uh, that there is no gas there to speak of, and it's gone in a couple of years. I have no idea whether she's right or wrong, but but she basically makes the point that. Uh, uh, the advantage the U.S. has is that as compared to oil, which is an international market where price differences really have to do with mostly with well, how much you tax uh, the, 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 the gasoline um, in the oil, uh, the, the price differences on natural gas, because it isn't an international market right now, have to do with, you know, do you have it and is it local and can you get it out? And so we've got a tremendous advantage of natural gas. Um, we lose that advantage if we make it into an international market. So there, that's not the stress issue as much as the issue of people who have been sold the idea that this is wonderful natural, this is our nation's independence, which in to a large extent it is on this difficult issue. Uh, but then we're selling it elsewhere. Yeah. What would you say to our project having a dimension of the study of stress in the leaders of the industry, <laughs> and how stress might make them more or less receptive to change in trust and transparency. What a wonderful question. <laughs> what a wonderful question. Yeah, I, you know, uh, look, I, I, you know, I, I, I spent the week before this uh, in Midland, Michigan, on part of a sustainability environmental advisory committee for the Dow Chemical Company. Okay. This is a company that basically, uh, in the 1990s, decided it would ask environmentalists to tell it what it was doing wrong and has been continuing that all this time. And a large part of the discussion was on energy. And we had the CEO there. And the CEO spent an hour explaining why, you know, he believed in the following things having to do with energy. And um, uh, a couple of days after this was over on Saturday, this past Saturday, the New York Times' Joe Nacera was strongly pro fracking wrote an article saying the CEO, uh, you know, just attacking the CEO of Dow. I guarantee you that man was stressed reading that article. I guarantee, I can tell you that at the meeting he was stressed. I mean, we have uh, Jurgen Randers who wrote the, the Limitations of Growth 40 years ago. He's just written another book uh, about the limitations of growth, just attacking the CEO of Dow about how they're handling energy issues with him defending himself. But this is an issue that a good industry 
will basically feel stress, but also feel that they ought to have folks from the outside telling them that they're doing it wrong. And if I want to talk about the positive aspects of natural gas, I can tell you that Dow is now spending $20 billion building a major chemical plant in Saudi Arabia. I strongly doubt, I don't know for a fact, but I strongly doubt they would have started this process about a dozen years ago, 15 years ago, if they'd have known that the natural gas was here in the U.S. They would have stayed in the U.S. They went to risk on to the Middle East. So there's no question that industries making decisions that have to do with what they think is the availability of gas, of gas and, and, and uh, uh, we brought up, I brought up very much the Deborah Rogers uh, analysis that I just mentioned of, you know, there really is no gas there. Uh, is that true? Is that not true? I don't know. He's got to know. He's making decisions. And he's under a lot of stress. And we can put him under more stress and sure. Do people operate at their best and their wisest when they're under stress? Mm. Uh, you know, so I'm, just so much, I'm, I'm thinking of, of standing in front of a, 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 a classroom of students, uh, if this was a class, uh, and um, I think you all look like you're awake, which was very different than if <laughs> you get the feeling that students are completely unstressed these days. I mean, uh, their only real concern is how quick can they go. <laughs> uh, so I, 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 it's always been an interesting issue, and it's an issue that's, that's, that's generational. Uh, do we bring up our kids never to compete? Or do we bring up our kids to be in this highly competitive world? And that's got the stress component. That you're getting well beyond anything. That okay, well, I was just, I'm just I'm pushing the case about whether the stress that the natural gas industry feels might actually make them more defensive and less receptive to change in the building of trust. That's oh, sure. Really what, yeah. I, that, that, I think we all do that. I think we're all into uh, our first responses uh, to basically say uh, anybody who's saying anything that questions uh, where we're at is, is simply wrong. But, uh, you know, this Andrew Livers, the CEO of Dow, basically, Dow folks, they keep on evaluating whether this external advisory committee made up of environmentalists who are attacking them uh, has been of value to them, and they keep on saying, yeah, it's been of value to them because it's basically, uh, in the old days, it alerted them to where issues were. So I remember when I first got on this in 1990, uh, 1989, they, they simply didn't believe there was an issue with plastics and chlorine. That's nonsense. Chlorine's plastics are fine. Nah, nothing to worry about. And basically, we just hammered the hell out of them. When they evaluated whether or not this was any value to them, it was basically, we alerted them. Now it's completely different. Now it's how, we can, how can we make money out of sustainability? So they got a shingles. They got a new shingle, which is just about to come to market, which is uh, basically got an electric uh, solar cell in each uh, shingle. So when you get your roof replaced, you can get it done. And I, I think the powerful thing about this is it could be done by roofers, not by you know needing to call in a specialist to, in solar technology. The, the average roofer can put this in, at least it's so it's designed. We'll see if it works. But they're now moving to, gee, how can we make money out of sustainability? How can we develop materials that lighten the car, the weight of the car, so it's less gas, but yet still have the same safety? I mean, it's that old trade-off of that old steel car, which, you know, 12 miles a gallon, if we were lucky, uh, would be a hell of a lot safer car in many ways uh, if you got into an accident because it wouldn't bend the way our plastic cars do. So how do you, how do you deal with that? So you got smart people trying to make money, but to do it in a way that's sustainable is what we need. I should now try to inflict stress on you uh -huh. <laughs> by asking whether you have any thoughts that you may have left yourself with a vulnerable flank for accusations of having become an advocate when you speak for stop in yeah. ways that might undermine some of your credibility. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm in this wonderful position of being a professor emeritus. So the University of Pittsburgh, which is in a big political issue, I mean, our governor strongly supports fracking, and our governor cut all our state university budgets by 50% the first year he was in. He was only 30% his second year. Uh, and so there's an enormous battle going on to restore that and, you know, to make the governor feel less. And, and, and here's all this fracking going on. And, uh, and I'm the perfect spokesman for the university, see? Um, if I say things that the university likes, for instance, today, or it's reported in the press, they can take credit for me. 
But I'm Professor Emeritus. If they don't like what I said, it's, well, that's why we got rid of that turkey. <laughs> so, I, so I'm not in the lab. I'm not really doing the research anymore. I'm far more outspoken, I think, than I would be if I was, if I was still doing the research. But to me, the major issue is we as a state universities, wherever we are, have the responsibility to inform the public about what we know. And if we can't find out the information, then we can't really give the information that's that's the best statement for retirement I think I've ever heard. <laughs> I can't wait for my lifestyle of the future there. Uh, two last questions. Why were there no health people appointed to those three commissions? Was that just pure accident and oversight? Was it those people caused trouble? Was it those people won't have long-term longitudinal health data, so we won't know, we won't have conclusive evidence? I mean, why, was, why did that happen? I think partly because we raise issues which are difficult to deal with and <coughs> rather make believe that they don't exist. And I think it's probably our fault. I mean, the paper, in our discussion, we make it very clear that we think part of it is that uh, uh, those of us in academia are much more willing to go out and deal with trying to get more budget for NIH to give us more funding and not willing to deal as much with the local political issues that people are concerned with. And we need to do a better job of that. And that's overall, I would argue that schools of public health tend to do a better job just by the very nature of who we are than most of the rest of academia, but we still not doing a good enough job. We're still too focused on advancing the frontiers of the environmental health science. It's important, but not focused enough on what are people concerned about related to the environment. So, and my last question is what you would do if you had imperial powers to get more, uh, to get things really moving on that accumulation of studies, the critical mass of studies, the replication, um, what, what might produce that outcome? Well, first I, I appoint you as the benevolent despot. Thank you for that decision. No, look, this is in my size. This is just basically Every chance you get, you make sure the information is available. We have, for instance, a very big part of our uh, of our state law, which I understand you don't have in Colorado, is that the law says that if anybody within a certain distance, I forget what it is, of a fracking site, the groundwater has been well water contaminated, the presumption is it was caused by the fracking, unless you get a baseline. Uh, unless the company goes out and measures what the water is now to see if it, maybe it's something that would have been there. Anyhow, we've lots of old coal mining and whatnot things, and it could well be natural if you look at contamination. Uh, well, I can't access that data. That's a wonderful database that is going to allow us to understand groundwater, and it, it's, it's useful and well beyond the fracking issues. Why can't I access that data? You know, DX with people's names taken off and all the things we do, I should be able to do that. I should be able to get the data that uh, 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 the state uh, uh, the state is doing some analysis of groundwater. They're using a specific suite of chemicals that they analyze for, but the the analytical technique they use gets a whole bunch more chemicals. It's basically it gives you all these peaks, and you just it just reads out how much is in all of them. He stays only reporting those and is basically refusing to reveal the other uh, information. Well, why? Why can't I, I, I get this kind of information in normal? Why can't I do a standard surveillance approach? A pu public health surveillance, jacks are better for openers in public health, is you basically open a line that says, okay, anybody who calls in who's concerned about their health, I'm going to take the information down, I'm going to do some sort of checklist, I'm going to see whether it's this kind of problem and that kind of problem. We're not doing that in Pennsylvania. I don't know what they're doing in Colorado, I don't know. But there's no involvement there. The CDC is not involved. It's being told, stay out of it. The federal CDC and President Obama doesn't seem to be very interested in, in getting the information. And in the long run, that's what's going to be the major problem. The industry is hurting themselves. We are hurting ourselves as a society by not trying to get the, by not out going and doing what we routinely know is the right thing to do in these kinds of situations. Hmm. Got to do it. That's a good concluding remark. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking you.